Psalm 13. It's getting good here. We're finally getting some momentum. And this is actually another short psalm. It's only six verses. I mean, there's, I think, one that has only two verses, or four lines, and then one that has 140, 150 or so lines or something. It's great. It's crazy, actually, in a great, 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 great way. Let's get into Psalm 13 because there's not much that I can preface that I would normally do with the other psalms before. As when we get to the very end, what I like to typically do, this is at least for me to explain my thought process, is that what I would like to do is first go to the very bottom and then read the last few verses, if not the last verse. What is being communicated at the very tail end of the psalm or the chapter or the, or the passage? And then when you have that as a reference, then when you go to the very beginning, you know what the what it's intro being introduced or how it's being introduced and to the direction and destination it will be going. So when you look at the very last verse here, I will sing to Yahweh because he has dealt bountifully for me. There's a lot of great things to mention from here I would love to deep dive into, but... Just to know that what we will be seeing at the very beginning will lead ultimately to a Psalm of David, King David praising God. Why does he praise God? Who is God? Let's consider who God is. That's what we'll do at the very end here. How long, O Yahweh, in verse 1, will you forget me? How long, O Yahweh? Pause. This is one question right here. Everything else is, let's not think about that. That's one question. How long, O Yahweh? How long, God? Really? Like, it's just one, it's one of those complaints. It's one of those, quote unquote, lamentations. It's, I have been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. God, how long? How long until you deliver me? How long until you deliver this stress from me? God, I have... I have been patient, and I am at my wit's end. That's what King David was going through. I am certain it is not exactly what I was describing. <laughs> I am guaranteed that it's not exactly as I was describing. But let's at least exp All that we have are, again, bits and pieces that we can extrapolate, extract from the text. What type of mentality or persona, what type of emotional temperament would you have if you ever were to say those words. How long, God? How long? I am waiting. <laughs> it's, it's just... That's, the, I, that's, I think, what the sentiment would be. Will you forget me forever? Pause right there. Will you forget me? King David is at a point in which he thinks that God has forgotten him. But here's the interesting part. If we have what we have already read, the last few Psalms, 1 through 12, multiple times King David brings up an issue, not necessarily in this order, but he brings up an issue. And then he says, God, I know you don't forget. I know you don't. This seems initially as though King David is a bipolar king, but he's not. He's going through the very right, correct ways of dealing with God. Well, let me say it this way. Through his failings of dealing with God, and I mean by right is the more natural, not the correct way of dealing with God, we fail to understand how God's timing is perfect. Our timing is terrible. We want it right now in our way, and if we don't, then any and all things and people are wrong. But God says, I have it. Relax. Don't be anxious. I got it. I got you. And even if I don't have you in this life, I have you for the rest of eternity. Your momentary affliction matters not. And what happens to you? actually happening for you for your good so it's just it's just the continuation in more of god and king david is going through a process we all go through and if you haven't gone through this i actually ask and plea to start considering not god being in lack in your life but continuing to seek 
him. Okay, let me say it this way. It's like, if, you, if you're not considering what King David is going through, that's a blessed thing. The only means in which I... The only reason in which I say it would be a good thing for you to quote unquote go through what he goes through is just so you can understand and gain gain the experience that when God seemingly is not in your life and he is silent in in your life and he's just quote unquote neglecting whatever is coming upon you. I mean, for example, in uh, Alabama this week, this last week, Alabama. A sweet 16 birthday party had three people, three young men, shoot up a sweet 16 birthday party, injuring 16 people, killing at least four of them, teenagers, and then five of them are still in critical condition at the hospital. God. Why would in the world you allow that to happen? Why? See, that would be a point in which it's, God, there's evil happening. God, people died. My child died. Why? Why? To come to God and to, to even have a moment of reflection of, of emptiness. Why, God, would you allow such a thing that we tend to forget what it is that God said and that we think ourselves so highly to think that the plan that has been happening is according to our own desires and our own thoughts and ideas? God is eternal. He has created creation for a purpose and a plan to glorify his son always. And upon the final day, those who are his sheep will be given life eternal for all, for all of eternity, been given all things. We can't grasp that concept. Do, do you have lack in your life? God will provide. For all of eternity, you will never have lack again. Did you lose a loved one? God will provide to you your loved one. I, 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 it, like, well, let me say, explain it this way. The book of Job. I know it's a it's a large book. It's a it's a very large book. A lot of a lot of things we can learn from it. I know we're kind of getting uh, off detail here. Um, a lot of things that we can learn from the book of Job. But at the very end of the book of Job, in chapter forty-two, I believe, God blesses Job with double. He gifts him double everything that he lost, and yet he only gained seven more children. I think it's seven sons and three daughters. I might be wrong there. And then, like, what happened to gaining double? What happened to the gaining of double of everything in which he lost? The children that he lost are still his. That upon the final day, the family in which he lost, he will gain back. That the seven children, I think it's seven sons and three daughters, I might be wrong there, it could be four sons and three daughters, but the children that he lost originally will it are still his. You and I think that, again, quote unquote, detachment of when something is taken from us and maybe given to somebody else, God has a purpose for that and a plan that exceeds our wild expectations and our current momentary afflictions, our current understanding about how he governs and runs the world. Why would you allow this? Uh, God has a purpose and a plan. If we have an issue and if we have a calm, a qualm, King David is saying, King da or God is allowing us in his scripture. King David is saying, why, God, will are you waiting? Have you forgotten me? That's what's being communicated here. That King David is going through issues, and he's saying, God, are you there? It's, but to always treat God as God, he is your heavenly father as well. But he's king. And you come into the throne room with respect and reverence to him his lordship but he is still your father that you're not you're not banned from his throneship you are 
required to honor his throneship as a prince, as a princess. <laughs> That's, I haven't really thought about that, but that is correct. Let's get back to it. How long will you hide your face from me? How long will you, God, hide your God's face from me, King David? That's, he's, he's coming with a lamentation to God and a, a, a serious qualm. You, God, are, you're not present, it seems, in my life. Why? It's like, will you please intervene for me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul? Um, let's read the rest of this one question because I want to get back to this one line right here. Having sorrow in my heart all the day. I think this is King David referring to him taking counsel in his own soul that has sorrow in his heart is that he's, con he's constantly reflecting on the sorrow that he has. He's leaning on his sorrow. He's not able to have joy in God. And just like all the day, I'm tired, woe is me, ah, why? Okay, we, this is very, this entire thing is counter to what we read at the very end of the passage, or the, the chapter. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? That's actually a great question, and a question that may never be answered in this life. There are many questions that are never answered in this life. How long will the person who has more wealth, health, love, fame, fortune, and freedom that hates God and seems to be the most loving person in the world but just hates Jesus Christ, God, why would you allow that person to reign with great gifts? Why have you given me any of these gifts? Like, See, that, that, that's an issue. Like, again, let's just say a personal issue I've personally gone through and am currently going through. But it's always that constant reminder. Who is God? The infinite, eternal one who has all right and reason. He is the, he is the rhyme and the reason in which breath is able to be drawn in the first place. My, my heartbeat is able to be pumped because of his good grace in which he gives to me to begin with. I am able to look through my eyes the most magnificently crafted biological, technologi technological, technological um, innovation is the eye. The eyeball is a phenomenally constructed item that has been given to me. And I have two of them, just in case I lose one of them. <laughs> Yeah, I've actually met a person who actually only had one eye and they didn't have an eye patch. They were homeless and they were like 63 years old. And it's like, my gosh, I'm sorry. I gave them a ride um, They because just walking made them weak. And it's like, oh, my goodness. God, thank you. You, you gift, you gift, you gift, you gift. You take away. Oh, you take away. But God, it's a you who are we are to seek and love and cherish and admire. But if God is doing all these wrong things, why would I do such a thing? That's a great question that is being brought up in chapter 13 at the very beginning. King David is saying, God, where are you? I have enemies who are above me. Where are you? That's, that's a claim, a qualm that King David is bringing to God. He is lamenting out loud. There we go. Look and answer me. Oh, Yahweh, my God. See, this is King David, who has been anointed. And one thing that I will mention here, I'm going to preface something before I get into it. King David has been anointed, again, by oil, but oil being a uh, uh, what is it called? Demonstration. A demonstration to show the act of anointing. Not that oil does any anointing, anointing by itself. The intention and act from God to man through his prophet, he gives anointing. Blessings. The one who, let's just say a blessing. Blessings from God. 
You yourself have Christ in you. You are anointed with all of eternity's blessings with God. God is the goal. God is the objective in everything. And he gives you that with the Holy Spirit, the seal of the promise, the seal of righteousness in you for having faith and trust in Christ to be your one and only Savior from the wrath that has been fully paid upon Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, for your sins, your hatred, your ag agonizingly rebellion against God. Jesus Christ paid for it all. He did. You deserve much worse to come, but Jesus Christ paid for it because Jesus Christ does the will of the Father. And the will of the Father was to save a people who hated him. That the, the will of the Father was to give up his only son, in whom not one sane person in this world could do. Think of the act, the act of being able to give your son, whom you, you, know, you know you could resurrect, but the act of pairing them from this life... You can't even imagine the depth of love a person, a father, would have for his children that are not even his, but wishes to adopt them into the faith. Adopt them into the kingdom as his own heirs. We can't, can't even grasp that. It's crazy. Crazy not in lunacy. Crazy as in can't even grasp the idea. Kind of like... The lunar, not the lunar landing, but kind of like um, space travel, literally having, an, having a satellite being thrown into orbit, and then for a few years, it roaming around the world and people sending radio signals, not radio signals, but um, phone signals to it for it then to be bounced off and then come back. 250 years ago, that would be a crazy idea that would seem quote-unquote uh, like a lunatic. But it is a real activity that has real consequences and real actions to it. Someone who would give up their own son that is not insane seems crazy. But why would that person do it? We don't have the total answer, and we might be trying to overcomplicate a very simple answer. Jesus Christ loves you. That God the Father loves you. And if we try to make it more complicated than that, we might not be able to understand internally in our own hearts, not just our pumping valve, not just this pumping vessel in our body, but literally within our mind, our heart is our will. Our will goes towards the action, is an action towards an object, or towards an objective, or towards a person. What is this? So when we contemplate and think in our minds, about love, God's love to us, it will change our will, our actions to then love him more, greatly, greater. That love is the ultimate end. It is the means by which all things are being run and governed. You are being loved right now. Love in this world, you are not alone in this life. It's not your mental capacity in which you think it, therefore it is. No, it is, therefore reflect on what is true. That is a dynamically different worldview opposed to the rest of the world who says that God is dumb and stupid and doesn't exist, which in of itself is so contradictive. God is dumb and stupid, also he doesn't exist. He doesn't exist, so he's dumb and stupid. It's like, what? <laughs> Anybody who believes in that, it's like, you're a biochemical, temporary, subjective, reactionary, opinionated accident with no rhyme or reason in this universe, with no inherent value at all, and yet you think that there is something inherently true with whatever it is that you say ever. It's like, why pay heed to people who hate themselves, hate other people, hate God most of all? Why? It's like, because they can do wrong, yes, you don't just ignore them, you help them. Help them learn to love. Not what they think of as lusts and passions. No. 
Love is to care for another person. Love is to consider the other person. And if the other person gave you life and gives you breath every single moment of the day, and then you have a rebellion and want to seek your own way, that's not loving. That's hatred. You hate yourself and you hate other people by not acknowledging what is true in this life. And anybody who tries to challenge you, you just, can't, just hate. It's like, why would you do that? Will you please learn to love? Learn to love in Christ who has given and given and given all of himself to you. That in him, he's the one we are to find our affection in. He's the one we are to find our peace and salvation refuge in. It's Jesus. It's not us. It's not things in this life. The things in this life, God has given us all things for all of eternity. So the things in this, in this life are really temporary. But we will get more always. Can't even say that about, again, I can't say that without a, and without cracking a smile. It's like, I can't even grasp that idea. I, for all of eternity, I'll be able to have all the things in this world. Like, what? I'll be able to have joy and family and friends, and I'll be able to have, again, a quote-unquote career. I'll be able to have work that I'm satisfied, if not fulfilled in doing. Like, I can't even grasp that, God. Like, like that's amazing. <laughs> Let's get back into the uh, passage. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. So I think this one verse right here is referring to wake me, do not let me sleep forever. I think that's what it's referring to. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. You could think of this metaphorically where he's, God, give me hope. So I don't see the darkness around me, so I'm not consumed by it. You can think of this literally when it's give light to my eyes, where literally when I go to sleep, I want you to please wake me. Please wake me. Now, it could also mean comfort, not just visual, not just a metaphorical, but also um, emotional comfort. Please, God, emo comfort me so this distress upon me isn't. So it's like you could probably interpret that three different ways, and I I would actually accept if your interpretation are in those ways, you might be correct, but you really can't extend yourself beyond those few ideas because what is Scripture saying to us? That should always be the primary, and if anybody comes with, well, just reads an entire section, and then they just go on to a, here's a monologue of what I believe it says, rather than, Look and answer me. What does this section say? 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 And then you go through the entire thing. Having somebody summarize what scripture says can be very helpful if you need a shotgun idea of what scripture says. Like, in, if on all, all honesty, you need to teach children this method and this means because there are large ideas that they may not mentally be able to attain because they don't have the experience, the brevity, or the ability to be able to grasp an idea and hold on to it for such a long period of time, much like the, the videos that which I've been making and just like going through this exegesis process. It's like, here's an idea. Now, this is what I think is what's being referred to about it. Let's try to extrapolate the idea. Now, let's just go on this tangent for a while. And then we'll do the same thing here, and then we'll extrapolate the idea, and then we'll go on this tangent for a while. So we're trying to e extrapolate as much as we can and then integrate it with all the other aspects within our life. And at least for myself, this is a very helpful process. I've actually helped somebody go through this process, and they themselves are uh, – they, ex they exegete very, uh, in real time too. So it's actually pretty cool. That I, I, I have seen the effects of this where um, – just in short, somebody who's above the age of 60. Yeah, they're actually very, in, like, very wise now. Uh, very intelligent because of scripture, because of God. God, most of all. God giving that gift. But um, just their ability to be able to exegete in real time and think about these things of, look and answer me. Who is me referring to? King David. Who is, again, Yahweh my God? What does Yahweh, what does the name Yahweh refer to? the great I am. So what is this one passage saying? One, his own personal name, King David is saying, Yahweh, my God, it's you. 
You are the name in which I am calling upon. It's not just saying generally my God, but you, God, personally, I am calling upon. So that's the, that's the thing I always um, I, I find interesting. Okay, going back into the verse 4. Lest my enemy says, I have overcome him. Again, the enemy, I, saying, I have overcome him whom is King David. And my adversaries rejoice that I am shaken. One thing that I will mention is that often within scripture, if you hear the word shaken, I don't think this is referring to you having fear. I, because again, the prior verse was referring to having overcome, having conquered, having dominated. One thing that I'll mention is that the word shaken, you will often see with the mountains, a God shaking the mountains, God shaking the mountains. The mountains in scripture, I would like to at least bring this case forward, is referring to Jerusalem, the cities specifically, because the holy mountain, Jesus, or Jesus, yes, God often refers to is Jerusalem. Cities in Israel reside upon mountains. They reside upon hills. When something is shaken, it does not mean I'm fearful. Oh, I'm terrifying and quaking in my boots. No, you are removed from your position. The shaking a found, shaking a foundation destroys everything that's upon that foundation. Shaking a foundation destroys everything that's on it. So shaking a king, who King David is, shaking a king being shaken is that he, you remove the foundation of King David, everything else is crumbles from there. So that's, I think, is what the word shaking is referring to. Now, if somebody says, no, it's actually referring to fear, I would understand that position. I don't think it's a holistically viable answer. I don't think that's correct. I don't think it is correct. But if somebody mentions that, it's not something that they're condemned to hell. <laughs> Again, I, there's, the only person who has correct theology is Jesus Christ. But there are things that are correct that we need to defend. Jesus Christ and Christ alone. If you don't have Christ, you don't have God. And But there are people, again, God shall save those and judge those according to what has been given to them. So if Jesus has not been given to them, God will judge them accordingly. And who does he often save and save all at, at all? The weak and brokenhearted and the downtrodden. He saves the people that are the least among us. And anybody that has been given... God judges you more harshly. So just to think of that and consider is that yet yeah, it is true. Jesus Christ is on, the only way to salvation. The people that don't have them doesn't have Jesus Christ. God will judge if not given Jesus Christ. But when you give the gospel, you give them the gospel according to Christ. You don't, give the, you don't give the gospel according to your own belief and what you value of, quote-unquote, kindness. Well, Jesus just wants us to be kind to each other. No, he commands you to repent and believe the gospel whom the good news is Christ. He has come to save the day, quite literally. He is the superhero. <laughs> yes, yes, he is. But I, King David, again, this was referring to, again, the I, this pronoun was referring to the enemy. But now that we're done with this section, I is referring to King David. I, King David, trusted in your loving kindness. This ED, past tense, King David trusted. My question before we move on, did King David lose his trust in God's faithful kindness? Again, your capital Y. God in his loving kindness? I don't think so. It would be very hard pressed before we move on to any of the other section. But I think this is, I have put my trust in you. Past tense, I have. Why would I remove that trust? In God, knowing who God is, why God is, and what God is. He's the one that is eternal. He's the one that's great. He's the one that's good. I'm not. He is. And he is my savior. He gives to me when I call. And if he doesn't give to me when I call, he has a reason and a purpose for it. And he knows intimately my woes and troubles. 
can't say that about anybody other person any other person it's like we're we're all in this we're all in this together in Christ so my heart shall rejoice in your salvation see i have placed my trust in you god i rejoice in your salvation i will sing to you yahweh god i will sing to yahweh I don't know if this is third person or first person, like speaking to God or speaking about God, but just I'm gonna I'm just gonna sing. I'm just gonna sing about you, God. I have all these woes and troubles in my life. What am I to do? What does King David do? I'm going to rejoice in your salvation. I'm gonna sing to Yahweh because he has dealt bountiful bountifully with me. You know what, God? I have a lot of these woes and troubles and issues in my life right now. There are enemies that are growing and in greater numbers. There are problems in my life, God. But you, God, have given and given and given and given and given and given and given. I have been given a bounty. Not a bounty of a bounty hunter, but I have been given abundance by you, from you, to me. You have given and given and given. And you know what, God? I'm just I'm just going to have faith in you. I'm just going to have trust in you. I'm just going to rejoice in you. Because let's think of it this way. There's a, a, a person I don't think any single person on the face of the planet may ever, ever see. And it's a very, very, not sad thing. But it's like, I'm sad for the other people in the world that aren't able to see the good, good works in which the person who is my friend who's, um, again, a homebound person from church who is stuck in a, a bed. He's uh, about, about like 54 years of age, and he has, he has a lot of medical issues. But one of the things that, has, that he is, is he's a prayer warrior. And for just, he's stuck in a bed. He's at a, um, a retirement facility. It's not the best retirement facility, but he, it, 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 they do well. They do well, and they... Um, he himself is a very, is very considerate, knowing that it's like it's being in a retirement facility is not the grandest of works and careers, but it's 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 sufficient. My friend is it's very cool to actually call him friend. He's a prayer warrior, and hours upon hours a day, a day, not just a week, not just a month, a day. He will pray and pray and pray. Not just because he does. He does pray for the him getting better. But when he looks on Google Maps, when he goes to Google Earth, and he sees uh, an image in North Korea that have been banned, all, most and all pictures have been banned from North Korea. But when there's an image of a, of a company that is allowed to operate in North Korea, one of the worst places to be as a Christian specifically, most persecuted places ever, and he sees three people in a building that are ready to serve as North Korea is trying to market, hey, yeah, we have businesses and companies, yeah, come on in. He, my friend, gets to pray for those people. Send a harvester. Send somebody to reap what you have sown, and if not, sow a seed in them. And it's like he prays that for hours a day. He does that, and it's it's amazing because that's the most like I it hmm, I, it's hard to explain it, but I would rather have somebody pray over me than somebody to just give me a hug. Because it, it, giving a hug is like, oh, I care about you. But bringing, bringing me to God and being brought to God by somebody with me, that's more than a hug. That's, you are literally bringing me before the throne of God and you are praying for something. It does not mean that I'm going to have my answers filled, but... Pray and pray and pray and you be able to sing, God, you have given me life. I ask that you give that person life. I ask that you give this person understanding that these momentary afflictions in this life are temporary. You are everlasting, God. I'm not. And you give abundance everlasting and evermore. 
to all of those who believe and have faith and put their faith in Christ to trust him for all of eternity, an eternal love community, but eternal love in you. And to continuously seek out the things that are good in your life. What, what can this passage, what can this chapter of only six verses teach us? King David did not have his issues dealt with. None of these issues were dealt with. What did King David do instead? You know what, God? I've, I am reflecting on all the things that you have done to me, for me. You have given and 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 given. And every single day, I will continue to praise you. Every single day, I will continue to reflect upon you. Every single day, I will continue to think about you. Every single day, I will continue to speak about you. And again, the joyous thing is that as though as that, again, quote unquote, sounds selfish to God, I am blessed by that process. I benefit from him having the eternal right, right the eternal right. He has always been, always is, and always will be. He never needed to create me, but he knew me before my mother's womb. God is good and remains good, and he has the eternal right to do with me as he pleases. And yet he chooses to lavish me and give to me the, not equality, but the right standing to be in his throne room, his presence, and be one with him for all of eternity. Why would you give me such a gift? I might try to overcomplicate such a question. It really comes down to Jesus Christ loves me. To do the, all the will of the Father, God, you love me. And you have given your son to die upon the cross for my sins, my rebellion against you. Any tarnish and taint, God, you have given a priest, a person who is in right standing with you for all of eternity to be able to bear the burdens and woes and troubles in which I go through in this life, you have paid it all. Every single one, you have paid it all. And I ask God to continue to put my faith and trust in Christ as he does for me always. And I ask that every single person out there listening, Jesus Christ loves you. He paid his, you, he's paid the burden, the price for your sins upon the cross. And in Christ, his spilt blood washes you clean. For all of eternity, you will have right standing, but before God, before God, because of Christ. And in Christ, you are righteous before the throne of God who lavishes you with all beauty and joy and wondrous things. Because it's him, God, whom is the prize of all things. Who has given these things. So remember. Jesus Christ loves you. Always.